All right, and ju just before we start tonight, I know it's a little bit unusual in a special meeting, but um, I just want to point out to you, I've been asked to point out to you that uh, Wednesday, September 12th, there's a Foster and Forever Pet Rescue event at Chili's Restaurant, so between 4 and 8 p.m., if you either bring one of these flyers with you, uh, and Pat has them, or bring a photo of the flyer on your phone and you go to Chili's here in Waterbury, they'll give 10% of the sales to the foster uh, and pet rescue. Uh, so just something to keep in mind, September 12th. With that, we'll call to order the special meeting of the Board of Aldermen for Tuesday, September 4th, 2018. If everyone would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance in a silent prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag. All the member Nully. Here. All the woman Cavallo. Here. All the woman Cato. Okay, it's one missing. All the men DG Oven Carlo. Here. All the men Dorso. Here. All the men Giacomi. Here. All the men Hadley. All the men Kula. Here. All the men Lopez. Here. All the men Matthews. Present. All the men Martinez McCarthy. Alderman Napoli. Here. Alderman New Jane. Present. Alderman Sherman. Alderman Pernaruski. Here. Twelve present, three absent. Thank you. Um, with that, we only have one item on the agenda this evening, which is a workshop regarding the proposed 10-year agreement with Jacobs for Operation Maintenance and Management Services for the Water Pollution Controls Water Collection and Treatment System. Uh, and with that, I'll call on uh, Mike LeBlanc to come up and make some opening remarks, and then he'll turn it over to Jacobs. We'll have a presentation, and at the end of the presentation, we'll take questions from the members of the board, if there are any. Mike. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity this evening to, uh, uh, to allow for this workshop presentation, uh, to allow for an overview of a propo proposed contract for the operation and maintenance and management of the water pollution control plant and the collection system. Um, several months back, uh, the city issued an RFP uh, to evaluate uh, the market as far as companies that were in the business of providing O&M services. Uh, the responses to those RFPs, to that RFP came in on June 12th, uh, at the beginning of this summer. Um, through uh, that process, um, there was a committee that was established that uh, went through a thorough review of the responses. Uh, there were uh, three companies that responded to the RFP uh, that provided the combination of the O&M services for water pollution control and for the collection system. And there was one company uh, that is in the business of directly operating uh, a sludge incinerator. Uh, we have a sludge incinerator down at the uh, wastewater treatment plant. And when we issued the RFP, we were looking for responses that would look to take over all of those operations, including the sludge incinerator, uh, but also uh, did open up the possibility of, of uh, a company responding directly uh, for uh, one or both of those overall services. Um, when everything came together, uh, and what we'll be discussing uh, in more detail this evening is, the respondent that was ultimately selected is uh, the company referred to as Jacobs. And Jacobs um, entered into a partnership agreement. It was part of their response to the proposal where they would partner up with Cinegro, uh, is who is currently the operator of the Waterbury Sludge Incinerator facility down at the plant. Um, we have, through this process, um, been able to uh, really establish the opportunity for substantial savings. Uh, we've reported to you in the executive summary that we believe there's an opportunity for a little over $12 million in savings over the 10-year life of this contract. Uh, the contract that is proposed is for 10 years uh, with, again, those, those savings opportunities, in this case, coming to the table both from 
uh, Jacobs as well as uh, Center Grove. Um, what's nice about the contract that is before you and will be discussed this evening is um, as part of the operation and management arrangement, uh, Jacobs will oversee uh, the operation of the sludge incinerator that uh, Center Grove will continue to operate. Um, so we have an ability to cover all the bases, if you will, from an operation and management standpoint. And it was critically important to, to the city through this process to make sure uh, that we did have um, all those bases covered, both on the, the collection side, uh, in the treatment plant side, but also, as importantly, on the sludge incinerator side. Um, there are, uh, these are complicated systems to operate, uh, and there are uh, significant regulations that are in play uh, from EPA and from DEEP that will continue to be in play as we go forward uh, if ultimately the anticipation would be that these regulations and requirements on the env environmental side are only going to become more stringent as we go forward. So it's important from the compliance standpoint that these issues are, are covered for the benefit of the city. Um, so again, there, there were three companies that had responded on the O&M side. Uh, and with Cinegro on the sludge incinerator side. We went through a process over the summer of evaluating thoroughly the responses uh, to the RFP. We met with each of the companies uh, to receive uh, presentations and to allow the opportunity for a Q&A session. Um, and through this process, um, we, we reached a, a consensus, a unanimous consensus through the selection committee uh, that we felt that Jacobs absolutely was the best qualified uh, to move forward in the O&M and M services uh, for the, the water pollution control facility. Um, it was at that point in time when we wanted to further the vetting process. Uh, the committee uh, and also the mayor, we took the opportunity uh, to go and visit uh, the plant that's operated uh, by Jacobs over in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Um, and they, in Woonsocket, the arrangement there, they started initially with a design-build concept, but ultimately that transi transitioned over into a long-term uh, operations arrangement. Uh, it's a very successful project for Jacobs over in Woonsocket. Um, the, the layout, um, the facility, uh, in talking with the people and looking at the improvements that have been made over at the facility in Woonsocket, uh, provided tremendous comfort to the selection committee uh, and the members that were, were on that tour that day uh, from the standpoint, uh, again, of reaching greater comfort with what under any circumstances would be and is considered uh, a significant transition um, that we're, we're looking to undertake. Um, when we reached that point where it was clear uh, without question that uh, we would like to move forward with Jacobs. We then entered into the negotiation phase of the process from a contract standpoint. Uh, what Jacobs uh, and Cinegro had initially proposed was very, very competitive. Um, but in furthering the best interests of the city and protecting the interests of the city, uh, we really did negotiate hard with uh, both companies uh, to ultimately uh, arrive at a final negotiated contract at rates that um, are going to produce substantial savings going forward. Uh, Jacobs, as you can imagine, was very, very interested uh, in landing uh, the city of Waterbury as a client. Uh, and Center Grove, as well, was very, very interested in securing a longer-term arrangement uh, with the city of Waterbury for uh, operating the sludge incinerator facility. Um, those interests combined, um, you know, with, uh, again, Waterbury contemplating going down this path uh, aligned from the standpoint of ultimately uh, furthering negotiations. Uh, yes, squeezing both companies where at the end of the day, uh, we've got a pricing structure, uh, a locked in pricing structure over 10 years that uh, again, it, um, on the savings side, uh, we are very confident that it'll produce uh, substantial savings year in and year out over the 10 year period. Um, I think it's important for me to highlight that, you know, on the financial side as the finance director, uh, you know, the monetary savings are significant, but I think as you'll hear from the presentation and certainly in comments that have been uh, conveyed in the press uh, recently, 
um, the savings are secondary uh, to the other uh, objectives and, and important considerations that are being addressed uh, through the, this arrangement from an operation and maintenance and management standpoint. Uh, there's an opportunity here for the city of Waterbury through this arrangement uh, to transfer significant risk, uh, both on the performance and liability side, uh, to the, uh, this company, Jacobs. Um, and additionally, when you hear uh, this evening about the depth experience uh, that Jacobs brings to the table, there's an opportunity to capitalize on their expertise and bring that to the table um, and their depth of resources in the event that there's any natural disasters or th different things that have to be contended with. Uh, we have an ability through this process to uh, uh, really further uh, the position of the city of Waterbury, again, as it relates to this plan. Um, before turning it over to Jacobs, I'll just leave you with this, that um, this is uh, an operation, maintenance, and management services agreement. Uh, the plan itself will continue to be owned uh, by the city of Waterbury. Uh, and the rate structure, the billings and collections, all of that will continue going forward uh, to be controlled um, by the city of Waterbury under the existing structure. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, to uh, the first representative. There's a couple gentlemen from Jacobs that are gonna present this evening. And uh, following that presentation, uh, we'll uh, certainly be available, all of us, for questions and answers. All right. Thanks, Mike. So my name is Steve Meininger. Uh, I'm responsible for managing the global O&M business for Jacobs. Uh, it's a large portfolio of O&M projects that we're responsible for. Um, I'm also the executive sponsor for this project on behalf of, of the company. And I'll be responsible to make sure that the team has the resources, tools, et cetera, that they need to be successful. I'd uh, like to thank Mr. President, the members of the board, the city staff who went through an exhaustive process from uh, RFP, site visits that we did, uh, interviews, uh, a due diligence where they went and looked at our facility operation, talked with our clients to make sure that what we were saying was accurate, and as Mike mentioned, a very thorough uh, final negotiation process that was extensive and painful, I must say. Um, but the city did a really good job of representing the interests of the, the residents. Uh, we go through a lot of these processes, and this was one of the most comprehensive processes that we've been through. Our team spent over 2,000 hours of time evaluating the facilities, coming up with our approach, um, and how we were going to deliver the services. So it was an extensive investment on behalf of our company to make sure we were proposing something that we could live with and commit to and provide a high level of service for the next 10 years. Um, we put together a brief presentation and welcome your comments and, and questions afterward. So I'm gonna start by talking about the background of Jacobs and our capabilities as a company. Jacobs is a U.S.-based company with extensive resources. We've got 77,000 employees worldwide. We have over 150 offices, work in over 190 countries, $15 billion a year of revenue. And most importantly, we've been working in the Northeast for over 50 years. And why is this important to Waterbury? Entering into a long-term contract like this, it's important to be entering in with a company that has financial strength, has reach back for technical resources that can adapt as needs might change over that period of time. We can bring the lessons learned from a global perspective to Waterbury. Uh, also important for emergency response and being able to bring resources to bear uh, when those needs arise. Our water business was founded on four simple values. Commitment to the environment, taking care of clients, integrity and honesty, and delivering great work. One thing we look at and look to is third-party benchmarks to see how are we doing in these important value areas for the firm. In terms of our commitment to the environment, 
our compliance rate has been over 99.98% over the last 30 years in our O&M business. In terms of taking care of clients, we look to our contract renewal rate, where we have the industry-leading contract renewal rate. In 2017, we re renewed 100% of our eligible contracts. Over the past five years, we've renewed over 97% of our eligible contracts. We view that as a strong indication of satisfied clients that want to renew our work with them. In terms of integrity and honesty, We've been ranked for nine consecutive years by Ethisphere as one of the world's most ethical companies. And in terms of delivering great work, we look at the engineering news record where we're ranked as the number one design firm, the number one wastewater firm, and have been one of the top three contract operations companies for each of the past five years. And we're the only water company that's got a truly integrated capability of being able to provide design, construction, and operations all under one umbrella, which, uh, which is very beneficial to our clients because we have that capability within the firm. When issues arise in any aspect of what a project might entail, we have resources that we can draw on within our company to help provide support. Turning to the Northeast region, We've got extensive resources within this region. We've got over 2,400 staff focused on our water business in this region, over 4,000 additional resources in other parts of the company. All the blue dots on the screen are places we provide O&M services, over 230 O&M associates, and the, the, the lighter green dots are offices we have, and we have an office in Hartford uh, as one example which is very important to be able to continue and maintain strong relationships with regulators, which we have in this area. By operating multiple facilities for many years in the area, we have very strong relationships with regulators, which is critical in this business, to be open, communicative, and understanding with the regulators so when issues do arise, there's mutual respect. In fact, at one of our facilities, the, the Norwalk facility where we provide O&M, the DEP, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, used our facility as a training ground for other, uh, um, other uh, companies or cities that wanted to get training on how to properly report spills, uh, as one example. Some specific uh, nearby facilities where we provide services, just to give you some context. And for this project, we'd be providing operations for your wastewater treatment plant, your collection system, and operating the incinerator. Um, so uh, and we'd be operating the incinerator utilizing Cinegro as a subcontractor. So just to give you some com perspective, because I'm going to have some comparisons. So it, in Norwalk, we've been operating their wastewater facility and collection system for 18 years. So similar scope in, in that regard. We also provide support to their CMOM um, activities, which is a program that applies to collection systems that's also uh, an area of focus for Waterbury. Uh, in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, we operate under a design-build-operate contract. We designed and built the facility, and now we're under a long-term contract to operate it. And where that one is also similar to Waterbury is Cinegro provides the incinerator operation there. We do the water and wastewater O&M, but then we also oversee that contract on behalf of the client. So very similar to the arrangement that we're talking about here. Uh, in Westerly, Rhode Island, we just transitioned that facility last year. We provide long-term wastewater operations there. And then in, for the North Hudson Sewage Authority, uh, based in Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, similar size facilities, similar scope, uh, as to what we'd be providing for Waterbury, although there we have two wastewater treatment plants that we operate, a collection system, combined sewer system. Um, uh, one of the noteworthy things there is we uh, renewed the contract a few years ago, I think it was about five years ago now, for 18 years, and at the end of that 18 years, we'll be there for over 40 years. So just an example of the long-term contracts that we have in this, in this area. Um, we also uh, were there during Superstorm Sandy. Uh, Kevin will give a little bit more perspective on that, but it was a good example of the resources we have to be able to respond to emergency situations. 
not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just a context of the kinds of large programs that we also engage with as a company. Uh, we were the company responsible for the program management for the Panama Canal widening project, and we were also the company through a, a joint venture with two other firms responsible for building all the infrastructure for the London Olympics. So just, again, perspective on the kinds of work that we uh, engage in, in addition to water and wastewater operations. So now let's talk about some of the highlights of our partnership with, with Waterbury, which is centered around public health, environmental protection, and cost savings. Critical to our efforts is managing your assets to, ma to maximize their useful life of all the equipment. We're the only water company at the time to have won the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award. Uh, what that uh, award process looked at was all the systems and processes and approaches that we used when we implement operations and maintenance of our facilities. It was a very exhaustive process. They sent teams of auditors out to about 15 of our facilities um, and ultimately confirmed that we did what we said we do. And we view that as an indicator of consistent implementation of those systems and processes, which allows us to drive for efficient operations, which ultimately saves our clients money by doing things in a different way than they can do themselves, because we can use our economies of scale and centralized resources to support projects in ways that cities can't, just aff can't afford to do. Uh, we're also able to leverage our engineering and operations experts off-site to be able to support in, in ways that can utilize a fraction of people's time versus having to commit large amounts of time in some cases to embed a resource that can be uh, uh, provided remotely. Uh, we talked about the relationship that we'll have with Synegro. Through this uh, relationship and the trust that we've built as working together at a number of locations, both our companies were able to provide a very cost-effective uh, approach. And Synegro providing the same service as one example is going to be providing that at a significantly reduced cost for the extended term of the contract that they're going to be able to provide those services. The total savings associated with that is $9.7 million over the next 10 years. And we guarantee performance and we transfer risk from the city to us through that process. In addition to the $9.7 million of savings I mentioned, there's an additional opportunity for the city to save money. Three specific areas, through the uh, negotiated contract, the city's gonna save, uh, be able to share savings in chemicals. So if we are able to uh, reduce the cost for chemicals, the city will share 50-50 in that savings. And we're confident through our approaches to operations that there is a good opportunity for additional chemical savings. We've also offered discounted engineering services through our proposal. These aren't required, but it's an offer to the city if they, if they want to leverage us for additional engineering services. These aren't the services that we'd just be providing as normal course supporting our O&M project. All these extensive resources I mentioned, are there's a lot of resource built in. This would be things outside that aren't anticipated at this time that the, the city may want to leverage uh, uh, our engineering capability. We've also identified through our proposal uh, uh, areas for energy savings in electrical specifically with some projects that can be implemented that have a return on investment that would justify implementing. And those savings will accrue 100% to the city because electricity is going to be paid direct by the city. So that's another opportunity of savings out there. We'll also be able to leverage our national agreements specifically around chemicals and other areas which help us drive to the savings that we've proposed. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kevin, but I uh, wanted to note a couple people before I, I do that. Um, uh, first, I'm going to note John Rickerman, who's at the bottom of the, of the graphic there. Uh, John is uh, based within 30 minutes of this facility. He leads our global technical services group, and he just happens to be located less than 30 minutes away, which is a really nice opportunity for, for the city. He'll be responsible for helping to make sure that we've got the, the resource and training on the ground for the staff here. 
Um, and he leads that group on a global basis. He has about 90 people in his group that provide those kinds of support services. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to introduce Kevin Dahl. Kevin will be our regional manager and is our regional manager over the Northeast region, has been serving in that role for a number of years. He's been working in this business for nearly 20 years. He's worked as a project manager over O&M projects. He was the project manager at our Norwalk project a number of years ago. Um, he's done multiple transitions of projects from public to private operations. He's also an engineer, professional engineer, um, and he actually has communication skills as well, which is a real positive, and he's a, a strong client advocate as well, which um, those who've worked with Kevin uh, know that he's, he's a, a strong advocate for our clients, which is, again, a, a real benefit for the city. Um, he's also a class four wastewater operator, so really a, a, a good mix of skills that are important to this kind of a, a project. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Steve. Excited to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, just a little bit more about me. I live in Monroe, Connecticut currently, which is only 26 miles, about half an hour, depending on traffic. Um, I grew up in Stratford, Connecticut. I'm a UConn grad with an environmental engineering degree, and closest to Waterbury, my dad used to work for City Trust, which was the building right through that window. I used to come up as a kid in the early 90s and color my coloring books in that building, so it's interesting to, to be back. Um, so further on our staff that we're bringing to this team is John Ahern. Uh, John is sitting over here on the bench. I've worked with John for over seven years. He's got 37 plus years of experience in the field. He's worked at a 200 MGD facility in Wards Island, New York. He's also been a project manager uh, in Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, he's a grade four uh, Connecticut operator. And uh, he's going to be the face of Jacobs here for Waterbury, and he's committed to this project, and we're excited to have him here. In addition to, to John, we have Chris Smith, who's sitting next to him. Chris has uh, worked with him for over 10 years. Chris has also worked in Norwalk and a number of our other facilities. He's coming with extensive experience in uh, maintenance and asset management. He's also a certified operator. And both John and Chris and myself also bring another level of certification that's emerging in the industry. You'll see up there it says CMRT and CRL. That's Certified Maintenance Reliability Technician and Certified Reliability Leader. And these are next level certifications for our maintenance personnel that we also want to bring to the team here in Waterbury. Uh, Mike Mitchell is the next person on that list. Mike is proposed to be our collections manager and he's coming from Maine. He's also from Connecticut uh, some time ago. Uh, he's a NUIA grade four collection system operator, as, as am I as well. Uh, so Mike is, uh, is, is excited to be here, but he couldn't be here today, but he's another member of our team and our talent that we're trying to bring to Waterbury. And as Steve mentioned, John Rickerman is last on the list there. And uh, Chris is also living in Burlington, Connecticut, so that's 30 minutes away, the same as, uh, as John Rickerman. So here, I know this is, I'm just gonna stay on the slide for a second, I know it's hard to see, but you'll see there's a, a top with some blue boxes and a bottom section with some gray boxes. And what the, the blue represents is our on-site proposed staffing plan, and the bottom is our, is our technical resources led by John Rickerman. So we'll talk about the top here for a minute. So if you look at that chart, there's some faces on there. You'll see Steve, you'll see myself, you'll see John and, and Chris. And these are the key people that we want to bring to the team. But the rest of those blue boxes up there, we need to fill with, with qualified staff. And our plan is to, is to, is to bring the people, the, the existing staff of Waterbury's plant, to bring them onto our team. Uh, we need to go through a hiring process, but we, can't, we don't have people that we're bringing in to fill all these boxes. We want to use the institutional knowledge and the experience of the on-site staff to augment our, our management team. That's our plan. Next is the Technical Support Services Group, led by John Rickerman. And these people are important because they bring expertise in certain areas like compliance, health and safety, laboratory, asset management and maintenance practices, uh, biosolids, community engagement, uh, HR, labor relations. These are people, and these are just a representation of people in the area, that they are conduits to the greater organization. So as Steve mentioned, John has over 90 people in his organization. And as you heard, we have over 77,000 in the greater Jacobs organization. So these people are important because they're going to bring that, that experience and that expertise that you normally wouldn't have access to to bear here in Waterbury. So another reason why these folks are important is our emergency response. And as Steve mentioned, Superstorm Sandy, I'll tell you a little story about that. And as residents here in New England, we know that there is a benefit to seeing hurricanes come up the coast is that we can plan for them. We can see them coming up the coast. Uh, Superstorm Sandy, we were watching for four days. We didn't know where it was going to land. 
And eventually, as everybody knows, it landed in New York Harbor. And we mentioned we have a new, uh, the Hoboken Project, which is right there in the harbor. So we had staff positioned all up and down the East Seaboard, including myself. I was in Woonsocket at the time. We had people in Hoboken. We had people in, in Florida and in that area that all mobilized when that hit New York Harbor. We mobilized that whole team. It was probably close to 30 people. And what happened in Hoboken is that Hoboken sits in a bowl. So the river's edge is actually above the lowest point inside the city. So the water came over the edge, filled the city up, and you needed a boat to get into the treatment plant. Now that's a major catastrophe when all your equipment, your motors are underwater, under salt water. So what our team did was we dewatered the site. We pulled all those, all those affected motors out. We sent them out to be cleaned and baked by a third party. We brought them back. We reinstalled them. And Hoboken was the first plant put back online for full treatment that was affected by Superstorm Sandy. And we're really proud of that. And you'll notice in the, top, in the right of that blue box, there's a plaque that Fred Pochi, our client, dedicated to the response team for that effort. And that's something we're very proud of. In addition to Superstorm Sandy, we've had more recent hurricanes hit this country. There was Hurricane Harvey in Texas, Hurricane Irma in southern Florida, and Hurricane Maria in hit Puerto Rico. Jacobs responded to each one of those emergencies and provided valuable relief effort. And the water treatment plant in Puerto Rico was also the first plant put, on, put back online that was affected by that hurricane, largely thanks to Jacobs. So we want to bring these resources to Waterbury. And so these are people that we invest in. These are people who are important. And that's what it's going to talk about next is the transition process for our staff here. And we know that this is a very difficult time for people. We want to put people at ease. We want to talk. We want to communicate. We want to make sure this is as, as, as clear and transparent a process as we can make. So currently, we're in the developing the partnership agreement phase, which is the step one on that chart. The second phase is the conducting employee workshops. We want to be transparent and tell employees what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and when it's going to happen. And we just don't invite the employees to these workshops. We invite the spouse or the partner, because a lot of times those are the people making the decisions, right? So we want to get everybody involved. We want to be transparent and become a, a family with all of our workforce. Uh, the third step is we're going to interview new associates. There'll be job, offers, po job postings posted that people will apply for. We interview those, and then we make subsequent employment offers. Um, and then we, when we hire those people, we, we start with an orientation process. And then finally, we implement a continuous training and development process. And this is key to our success. See, as Jacobs, we don't sell a widget. We sell services. So people are the core of our business. If we don't invest in our people and train our people and support our people, we'd have nothing to offer. So that's the key to our success is to develop the people that we're bringing to the team and the people that are already here in Waterbury to make part of our team and develop them for continuous success. So how do we know that this transition process works? Well, we measure it. So here you'll see some bar graphs. There's dark blue lines on the left and light blue lines on the right. These are pre and post surveys to employees to say what's their satisfaction level with their previous employer to their new employer being Jacobs. This is important, again, because people are our business. Um, we are committed to training and development. We, we promote a work-life uh, balance that's, that's positive for the employees. We reward good performance. And we also offer career opportunities that you currently can't offer. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what tools that we're going to bring to the table that Steve mentioned. I'm going to highlight two of these. So our, our systems are, are key to our superior operations in that Malcolm Baldridge Award that Steve also talked about earlier. So the one on the top of the circle is, is the job safety hazard analysis. And this is important. We, we have every task that we do, whether routine or non-routine, we ask our employees to fill out paperwork, which makes them step back and makes them go through each step of the job so that they recognize what the hazards are in each one of those jobs. They're doing that as a team. It can be, depending on the task, it can be an individual or it's a group of people within a department or it could be cross departments. And then a supervisor is also in that mix and taking a look and, and signing off. That, hey, you guys have thought about this. You're going to do go about this the right way. And what that does is mitigate our risk on safety and also compliance. Uh, another process I'm going to highlight is in the bottom right-hand corner. It's called process control strategy. And these are important because it's about compliance. So what we do is we hold these weekly process control meetings where John and his team and Chris We'll hold a meeting with operators, with mechanics, with collection system folks, and we're going to measure ourselves every week against targets that we set. And that's important because everybody's getting cross-coordination, cross-pollination of what the overall leadership strategy is for the project to see where we might be falling down to make corrective actions before they get out of control and become a problem. So these, these minutes, or these meetings are documented with minutes, and those minutes are also sent off to John Rickerman's team, who I mentioned leads our technical support services. So now we have a third-party QAQC oversight of what's going on at the project. So they can see trends that maybe the people that are too close to the day-to-day -day stuff don't see. And that's a value that I think that's something else that you can't have right now. You don't have that ability at the, 
current time. So the pro in summary, the process control strategy is fundamental to day-to-day -day compliance. Management and optimization from day one helps assure your facilities run their best. One of the first things we're going to do is a condition assessment of your assets. We notice the assets are in good condition. We want to make them in great condition. We want to extend the service life of all your equipment. And I think that lowers costs over time. In addition to that, we're going to develop our O&M plans, which, which talk about contingencies and emergency response planning, which we've already talked about. The staff training and resource allocation, and you'll see Pro2D2 on there. It sounds like Star Wars, but really it's just a fancy simulation software that we use to build on the plant, and we can run simulations of the plant in different scenarios. So, for example, if we were to take a tank offline, what impact does that have on the day-to-day -day operations? Or what impact that would that have in a future theor theoretical situation? And that data is shared both with the plant staff, with John's team, and with the city. So we manage day-to-day -day activities and also long-term planning. Outreach and public uh, education support effective community relations. Uh, we not only partner to run the wastewater treatment plant, but we want to partner, be your partner in the community. So in Norwalk, we partner with River, uh, Harbor Watch. In Woonsocket, we partner with an organization called River's Edge that do cleanups, that do educational outreach. We do tours at the treatment plants. Uh, we want to have presence at your community events. A couple organizations we've already started to reach out to are the Naugatuck River Revival and the Waterbury River Brigade. These are important. Uh, we're, we're in the water business, and the Naugatuck River is a, is a vital asset to the community. We want to preserve that. We want to make it better. We want to be your partner in doing that. We're here to stay. We work and live amongst the citizens here in Waterbury, and that's, that's our aim. We're, we're both local and we're global, and that's what we're bringing to bear here for you. So Jacob's commitment goes beyond conventional contract operations. Uh, it's a single source service approach that combines operations, technical services, and program management, like Steve mentioned. We're a single source of accountability, transferring that risk to us for compliance and performance. Uh, it's a reduced administrative burden for the city of Waterbury. Access to a worldwide network of technical resources and you share your risk as your partner. So we want to bring a higher level of service using tools and resources that you currently don't have. And we're excited to be here, and I want to thank you for this presentation. And now I'll open it up for opportunities for questions and answers. <clears throat> Alderman Bernelli. Thank you for coming. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, just give me an idea if uh, this is approved. A, a uh, the transition, I mean, when you come in, um, my thoughts are on the employees that work there already. I mean, they're given, uh, you know, equal opportunity to work for your company if they choose or if they want to stay with the city and move around. I mean, is it reasonable to say you guys pay pretty good money, have benefits and stuff? Yes, we, we have competitive pay and benefits, and our goal is we're going to make post job offers, and we welcome the existing staff to apply to those job offers. Because that's something we would need to know because we'd have to get those people working. If you're going to hire them, that's fine. If not, you know, it probably takes a month or so, right, to go through that? Yeah, we talked about a transition over about 60 days yeah, to get all the, the paperwork done. Yeah, because that's my top concern. Everything else looks good here. And uh, we, we, need, we, need, we need people. I wish you luck, and uh, thanks. Thank you. Alderman Napoli. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the agreement in indemnify or shield the city from liability in the event there's a spill or other issues associated with the operation of the plant? Yes, to the extent of our negligence and our responsibility, yes. Okay. Uh, do you foresee an increase in operational spending that would impact the city at all? No. Well, our price is guaranteed. Okay. Uh, what protections are in place for our employees, some who have been loyal employees for years? Can you talk a little bit about that? So our plan is to hire all the qualified employees that apply for jobs. Okay. How has Jacobs improved the quality of life in other communities that you serve? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. How has Jacobs improved the quality of life in other communities that you serve? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it mostly goes to the community engagement. We're not just coming in to 
operate a facility and come in and out of that facility and just work directly with the city. We immerse ourselves in the community. So we're looking for how can we and our staff engage in a broader way. And every which way we do that, we're hopefully improving the communities that we're serving. And, and I'll also add, I mentioned the career opportunities. So as a, as a bigger organization, we offer a lot more uh, opportunity to employees that, that, that join us. So they can move across the country, they can stay locally and, and support regional efforts. Uh, you know, I, I started in Connecticut. I've been working here for 20 years. I'm now a regional manager. So I've had the opportunity to come up through the ranks. I started as an IPP coordinator. I've worked in collections. I've worked in maintenance and operations. So, you know, you, you get what you want out of it, and that can improve your quality of life. Do you serve any communities that have a union or bargaining unit that your employees belong to? Yes, many. Yeah. Um, most closely is uh, Woonsocket and Norwalk both have organized labor. Would you be opposed if you hired our, our workers back and they wanted to start or organize a labor union? No, not be. Thank you, Mr. President. Further questions? Alderman DG of Carlo. How you doing? Thank you for coming down. Um, the first question I have for you is, you, you said you're going to hire back all the workers possibly? Apply, all the employees that apply, yes. You said the blue spots are what you need to fill. You have 19 spots for 30 employees. So how are we going to, how are we going to hire back all the employees? There's more than 19 spots. I think there's, there's, num there's numbers in parentheses in, each, in some of the boxes that add up to more. What is that total? Do you, I can't see it. It's, it's or, uh, 32 maybe. I 32? don't have the exact number in my head. So, and, and then next, I, I guess the guaranteed savings is on the, the 9.7 million side? Correct. Correct? And that includes the 4 million from Sinegro? Correct. On the 3 million side, wh what do you see, I guess, over 10 years of discount engineering services and energy costs? So that's the $3 million that we see. That's what we've seen so far based on our 2,000 hours of due diligence. And we're confident that once we get on site, if we get on site with that opportunity, that we'll find additional opportunities. So there's, there's some, I'm sorry. Go there's, there's opportunities such as maybe a more efficient uh, blower operation for the aeration tanks or uh, modifying some of how the aeration tanks are, are operated every day that would save power. Okay, because I mean, to get three million on a 50-50 split with just the chemical allowance alone, you're going to have to save a pretty substantial amount of chemicals if we're splitting it 50-50, correct? Correct. It's not just chemicals. It's all three of those buckets combined. I understand that, but I'm, I'm wondering what's, that's why I'm asking you, what is discount engineering services going to cost the city of Waterbury over 10 million, over 10 years? I can just address the, uh, the breakdown of, of the projected opportunities for savings. On the chemical allowance side over 10 years, uh, it's estimated at $740,000. For the discounted engineering services, uh, half a million, $500,000. And for the energy cost savings, which is where the significant opportunity is with various uh, improvements and opportunities uh, that Kevin spoke to, uh, we're projecting uh, just a little over 1.7 million over 10 years on energy cost savings. So 745 and one point what, Mike? Uh, so it was 740 on the chemical allowance, 500, on engineering services at the discounted rates and uh, 1,700,000, uh, to be exact, 1,735,000. Okay. And, and they would pay for the uh, upgrades for the energy cost savings? Uh, the capital upgrades uh, would be a cost that uh, the city would incur as uh, part of its normal uh, capital program associated with the plan. Again, these are assets that the city is going to continue to own uh, throughout the life of the contract. Uh, but it's the operational opportunities uh, that Kevin alluded to with uh, how uh, certain components of the equipment are operated, uh, where they believe there's opportunities where it can be done a little bit differently that would produce lower energy costs in the day-to-day -day operational. Okay. And um, the, the four million from Sinegro, Mike, did, did we negotiated that deal with Sinegro? Uh, it was uh, a combination of their proposal and working with them uh, through uh, leveraging the extension of this contract or the period of this contract through 10 years. Um, Sinegro has brought to the table uh, a substantial reduction in the uh, per tonnage disposal fee 
uh, for the uh, sludge uh, that is burned at the incinerator at the plant. Okay, and this is for the Jacobs guys. I, you say you're going to hire staff back, and and the bottom line is, I, I guess I'm with Alderman Brunelli on this. All, all I really care about is these workers remaining working, and if they could join a union, that's great. They may want to stay with you guys, that's great. But why can't we put it in the? Is it in the contract that you are definitely hiring them? Because Mr. Temer confirmed the promises to hire all current staff comparable to improve salaries. Their skills will be assessed, and then when he gets to the end, he basically says it may not be in the contract, but we assure it. We made a pledge to the city to that effect, and that's how we work. It would be unethical to say one thing and do another. You guys are a billion-dollar company, and I'm sure, you know, I, I, is, is it possible to put it in the contract that you're hiring? I believe it is in the contract. It is in the contract that you're going to definitely hire our workers. We're going to hire qualified employees, and again, they have to apply to the job. Okay. I, I don't know that they're going to all apply. Okay, because the article in uh, Monday's paper doesn't make it sound like that. So, okay. Very good. Thank you. Further questions? Alderman Cotto. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about issues that were solved. Uh, could you give some examples of issues arise um, from the past? and how they, they have been um, solved in regards to the companies that, or the projects that are similar to the one that you want to bring here to Waterbury? So I understand the question. Um, you're talking about problems in other communities that Jacobs has solved? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can speak to Woonsocket for one, and I'll let Steve talk more if he wants. Um, Woonsocket had some compliance issues, and they had some uh, stricter regulations that were coming down for phosphorus removal and total nitrogen removal. So the problem that we solved was an innovative solution at a, at a cost effective. We, it was a competitive bid process that we won and saved Woonsocket millions of dollars and also are knocking it out of the park with the compliance as it compares to the new permit that they're under, which is one of the strictest limits in New England. Okay. And, um, so you will have a, or Sinagro will have a subcontract with you. Um, it is a well-recognized company. However, some environmental leaders have concerns in regards to their operations and liability. What is the extent of your supervision over Sinagro? Overseeing Sinagro. So their, their current contract is going to run to term, which is three more years. And then they're, and we're going to oversee them during those first three years. And then there'll be a direct subcontractor to Jacobs, and we'll have complete control. Okay. Um, in regards to surveys that you conduct, um, how often are how often are the surveys, and what measurements uh, suggested by the employees have been implemented so far? So we we aim to conduct an annual employee survey across all of our employees, um, and then we do them during these transitions to. to trying to gauge how we do before and after. And what was the second half of your question? Which su suggestions have been implemented? Um. Yeah, I, I, we implement um, uh, suggestions around how we do in terms of working hours, how we do shift schedules. Um, we've implemented um, suggestions around where we focus our company resources and training and tools and um, um, so it's just a variety of areas and, and we do annual surveys we do them company-wide and then we do them specific within our O&M group um, to make sure we're getting the, the hourly and craft perspective properly represented and we've been we have a consistent survey that we've been using for like the last 20 years so it's very easy to compare year over year and look at trends and be able to adapt to specific trends. Uh, we also survey as part of that process all our customers every year so that we're getting feedback as to where we need to adapt. We survey on how's our regional manager doing, do you see them, are they, you know, and all the way down to our, you know, are we being responsive to your needs, are we delivering the quality we said, are we saving the money we said, you know. So a very consistent approach to surveys and taking the feedback. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about the outreach uh, and I think that is amazing, and I thank you for that. Um, I would suggest for you to also reach out to the Environmental Control Commission, because they are very active and are advocates about our environment in the community. 
And I appreciate and I thank you um, on behalf of, of the people of Puerto Rico for your work there. Thank you. Further questions? Alderman Giacomi. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate you coming down here tonight. It's an important discussion and would really be a major change here in the, in the way that the, the city operates, obviously, this, this particular area. So um, I think this is really good uh, to have this presentation and, and hope uh, that you can sort of help me out here with a couple questions uh, based on the contract. I'll be the first to admit this is not necessarily my area of expertise, um, but I did take the time to reach out to some people that I know that work in this industry um, and, and have a few things that, as I said, hopefully you or city representatives can help me out with. Um, I guess the first one will, for Jacobs, not necessarily the city, is uh, looking at section 5.9, um, that talking about capital improvements that the contractor would have to pay versus uh, what the city would have to pay. I think it's allocation of maintenance and capital costs. Um, for me, that was a little bit confusing, some of the different terms where it would be Jacob's responsibility versus the city's responsibility versus a shared cost. Um, would you be able to perhaps walk through a couple of examples of when, of typical examples of when the contractor would have to pay versus a typical example of when the city would have to step in and, and bear that cost? Right, so the way that contract is structured is that any expense that's $10,000 or less is on Jacobs, every instance. And then every instance over 10000 the city will pay the first five instance, incidents, uh, the entire cost, and then if it's the sixth and beyond, Jacobs will pay the first 10000 of every incident after that. But the capital cost is still on the city. That's okay. not priced in our... Okay. Um, so as you said, it the first five over 10,000 is on the city. That's what you just. That's correct. Um, and this is really tied into, uh, keep in mind, anything associated with uh, normal maintenance and repairs um, throughout the course of the year uh, falls on Jacobs, okay? Um, the example I would give you that they presented to us where it would fall into this capital repair component would be a pump that has to be replaced. Um, and you could have a scenario where either it's a planned event as part of the capital plan or it's an emergency case scenario where a pump went bad uh, despite the continual uh, maintenance of it and it has to be dealt with. Um, in most cases, the repair uh, and or replacement of a pump is gonna far exceed $10,000. Um, and what we wanted to do was leverage um, some responsibility, some uh, uh, buy-in from Jacob's standpoint where um, after the first five, um, they would then be responsible. Uh, going forward. So uh, recognizing, and this was part of the negotiation process, recognizing that they're not intimately fam familiar with the condition of the systems and the equipment, et cetera, uh, we felt it was fair in the negotiation process that we would take the responsibility for the first five incidents. But after that, again, the first 10,000 thereafter would be on Jacobs. Um, so they would have a, a vested interest uh, in absolutely maintaining the equipment to the highest standards possible to prevent um, uh, any uh, premature repairs uh, or uh, failures in the equipment. Okay, and I, I think that kind of leads me to the next part, which is a little later on in that section, um, section 5.22, with the, the capital expenditures at the request of the contractor, Jacobs, um, and they'll have to submit recommended expenditures to the city uh, before a date certain of each year of the contract. Now, it says the city has the ultimate approval or rejection authority over those requests. Um, however, it says, if the contractor, and, and you bear the burden of proof, demonstrates that the recommended expenditure is required by prudent industry practice, um, and that it's not the result of your failure, failure to operate, and that you've exercised prudent industry practice to sort of avoid or mitigate the impact of its performance, et cetera, and the city nonetheless decides not to consent and pay for such recommended expenditures, then you shall not be required to meet your performance obligations here under, and you should not be liable as any damages as a result. Um, again, if I'm reading that correctly, it, it does have the potential, potential, and, you know, in life there are unexpected things. It does have the potential to be kind of scary. Um, if you step in and you come in and you start inspecting things and you do a full assessment and you outline and you see deficiencies, um, 
what's there to say that you don't step in here year one, year two, and start to look around and do your due diligence and say, wow, this is you know, worse off than we thought. You need all these capital improvements. It's not prudent industry practice to not do them. It's, it's going to be pretty expensive to get it up here. And if you don't do it, you know, we, we can't be responsible for the results. Um, now, I, I know you said you've been in the plant, or you have, you have, and you've started sort of to do a review, and you feel comfortable that we, we are sort of, a, that all the equipment and all the different capital things in there are okay and have been historically maintained with prudent industry practices up till this point? So we, we spent, as we said, 2,000 hours of due diligence mm -hmm. in the plant. So I wouldn't say that we have an intimate knowledge, but we have a high level knowledge of what's there. And we're, we're confident that your facilities today are in good condition. Okay, so you would say that the, the plant and the collection system has been historically maintained with these prudent industry practices up until now? To, the large, to a large extent, yes. Okay. You know, I, I think the one thing I think everyone would agree with is you'd want to avoid something like a smooth year one and then going into year two, some sort of massive surprise capital improvement request that's based on maybe, you know, historical sort of things that you couldn't see in those 2,000 hours or something like that. Um, the next one, I, I guess maybe, Mike, it could be for you. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I don't want to jump around too much, but uh, actually, I'm sorry, looking at my notes here. Do you have an anticipated request, budgeted request? I know you said it's been 2,000 hours, hours. You don't have a intimate knowledge, but a pretty good knowledge. I mean, do you anticipate what kind of capital improvement request you'll make? I think that's premature right now, but as I mentioned in the presentation, we're going to do a condition assessment, so we're going to bring in those expert technical resources. They're going to go through all the assets, and there's thousands of assets in your facilities mm -hmm. between the pump stations and the treatment plant, and we're going to score those based on condition and their risk, uh, but, uh, which is their potential to do you know, harm or non-compliance events, and then we'll, we'll evaluate where the priority is to spend money. And that, in the first year, that's required by February 1st, a, a submission on the capital. Right. And then I guess, uh, Mike, perhaps this is for you related to that. You know, we're projecting, I think you said $9.7 million in anticipated savings over the life of the contract, correct? Now, does that include what we anticipate for obligations for, for capital improvements to the sewer system? You know, how is that being calculated? Uh, it, it's, it's completely separate. From the standpoint of the capital obligations for the plant going forward, that's separate and aside from the operation and maintenance savings that are reflected in that $9.7 million. The fact of the matter is that for a plant of this size with the collection system, there will continually need be a need for the investment on the capital side. Um, we have every year adopted a capital plan for the water pollution control uh, plant and collection system. Uh, there is currently a five-year plan uh, in place. Um, that is going to get scrutinized by Jacobs as they come in and do the condition assessment. The burden of proof is going to be on them from the standpoint of validating the requests that are com coming forward as, as uh, each year progresses. Um, the fact of the matter is we established these dates February 1 of next year so that we would have the information in advance of submitting the capital plan request to this board uh, for the subsequent fiscal year. And then each year thereafter, it will be due on November 1, so we have ample time to uh, evaluate, scrutinize, and go back and forth with Jacobs to determine the priority and the necessity uh, of the capital investments that they're proposing to be made. Um, but at the end of the day, as it is now, as it has been, uh, as you know, back in 2015, there was a substantial uh, capital authorization that was approved, uh, recognizing the fact that there is a desperate need and will continue to be uh, for investment uh, in the infrastructure, uh, particularly on the collection system side, but certainly with the plant. The plant itself went through its last major upgrade, I believe, in uh, 2000 time frame, 1990, you know, 1995 to 2000. So, uh, you know, you're looking at a plant that is now, um, you know, 20 years in. And so, but uh, okay, I get that. Now, I guess just to be clear, though, as you said, I think at the beginning, the 9.7 is operations and maintenance cost savings that are anticipated. It's separate from any anticipated capital improvement costs. Correct. All right. Um, now, there's something I also, I guess, perhaps along these lines, talking about costs, et cetera. Um, I believe the contract provides a provision to renegotiate the yearly fees if it was, I think if it says if conditions change more than 10 percent than what is noted in that, I think it said Appendix B, correct? Um, is there any incentive? I didn't see it. Maybe I missed it in the contract for 
Jacobs to put into place some kind of system to reduce rainfall infiltration into the system. You know, the amount of rainfall and subsequently sewer flows, and again, this is me talking to people in your industry that said this would be a good question. Um, if rainfall increases and sewer flows increase, would the city likely have to pay more for operations because of that Appendix B and that provision in there to renegotiate? So there's a plus or minus 10% there, and it's, it's looking at the previous 12-month rolling average. Mm -hmm. So if flows and loads were to go, or it's just loads, flows are removed from that equation. It's really about loadings, which is the nutrient loadings, pounds per day. Okay. And so the best example, so the city is paying for power. So we have no, there's no, I mean, outside of finding savings, there's no cost increase for us if flows were to go up necessarily. When you look at, I'll use phosphorus as the example. You're doing a major upgrade currently to treat phosphorus down to a new limit that was imposed on the city. Uh, if you had a new industry that you brought to town that created jobs, created tax base, there might be incentive to do that, but they had a, a phosphorus loading into the system, it's going to cost more in chemicals to treat that, that same load. So that's what that provision is for, is that we don't know what's coming down the road in the future. It just gives us an opener. And we have the burden of proof to say it's a material change to our cost, and the city has to agree to that. Okay. And now you mentioned the the energy, electricity, I think it was the natural gas costs as well that are going to be on the city? I believe so. And then, um, this might be for Mike. Now, Mike, is that something that we, do we currently do that for Sinegro? Pay the electricity and natural gas costs? Uh, they uh, they uh, pay for it. Uh, it's through our account that they pay for it. So Sinegro pays for it. So we, I mean, I guess why here, to me, what was the reasons, can you walk us through why we wouldn't maybe want to put something in here that would incentivize Jacobs to use less energy? And, and now I know, I think based on listening before, you anticipate lower energy costs based on your historical performance in other, uh, other areas and other contracts that you have, but why not include something that would incentivize? Uh, well, I, I think part of that question was about the Synergro piece. So Synergro, mm -hmm. under that scope, has to pay for everything, power, utilities, all, all that stuff. And the reason for that is because it's a merchant facility and there's another, another revenue stream there. Um, but there, you're, you're correct, there wasn't an incentive put around natural gas. Okay. Um, I mean, Mike, do we know what the electricity bill was last year for the plant and for our, I think there's 20 pump stations? Um, I don't have that offhand. Okay, I, I wasn't sure, you know. Uh, if, you, if you did have it offhand, I would have been very impressed, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, <laughs> it's substantial, I will say it's substantial and um, one of the components that, you know, we're, we're continually trying to leverage opportunities for uh, energy incentives. The fuel cells uh, have been up and operating over at the plant since January. It's provided, tr you know, very substantial relief on the annual uh, cost of, of electricity. And again, I, I, you know, we are looking through the partnership with Jacobs to really love, leverage their expertise to go after, even if it's a capital investment on the city side up front, leverage those opportunities to lower the operating costs. Um, but there is an expectation from them. Um, you know, we are looking to see on the operational side, you know, through how uh, the, the water is treated, et cetera, uh, we are definitely looking for opportunities where there's going to be savings. And, um, you know, although it's not directly incentivized within the contract, there is an expectation that, you know, we will be uh, looking to have those discussions in the months ahead uh, to see what they're able to do. Uh, to, again, benefit the city from the electricity cost side. I'll just add one more thing to that. We do have an extensive uh, sustainability program within the OM group, and we'll be happy to share our annual sustainability uh, report, which shows we, when we track energy and utility costs, we set three goals per year, I believe. Right, John? Uh, per project that they are trying to achieve some kind of level of sustainability improvement over that kind. So we, that's, we're, we're driving that as a culture in our company although it may not be reflected exactly that in this contract. Okay. Now, I also noting here in the contract, um, I think it's section A4 that Jacobs will be, will be impl implementing, excuse me, a fats, oils, and grease program, correct? Yes. Now, I, I think this is the same thing that has come up historically here in this, you know, in the city of Waterbury, and if I'm relating the two issues correctly, and if it's the same issue that I'm thinking of, this is something that the city has historically pushed back on. Now, is this going to be something that's going to require every restaurant, you know, food service establishment to, to get a permit to how they're managing their grease or how they 
are, are dealing with their oils, et cetera. How will that sort of apply to you know, restaurants and other uh, uh, vendors in the city? So that, the, the fats, oil, and grease program is a current requirement by the Connecticut DEP. Right. So we'll just be enforcing the existing regulations. And I believe you had a previous uh, engineer, Wooden and Curran, developed a, a, a plan for that program. We'd just be following that program that's already in place. Okay. Because I, again, and thank you, you know, for clarifying that. I, again, just trying to go from historical memory. I know this is something that's cropped up in the past, but that the city sort of had pushed back on. So, Linda, I'm sorry if you want to add. Alderman, yeah, uh, it is in place. We are following it. And I don't know if you noticed in your last water and sewer bill, there was also a notice to everyone about the Oh, I noticed those water and sewer bills. There was a requirement about um, having the grease trap if you are commercial. There, there was a notice in it because it is in state law. We okay. don't have the local ordinance, and I think that's, that's I think that's what I'm thinking of. We okay. didn't have the local ordinance, but it's state law. It's also part of the Clean Water Fund's uh, requirements. All right. I appreciate it. Yeah, that, I think that was there was some push or some talk of a local ordinance some time back, and it's probably what was jogging my memory. Um, now, I guess, Mike, this, this next one, and it's kind of a big one for me, and, and to be honest, some other people that, I, that I've talked to, there's still a lot of responsibility and oversight on the city as part of this contract, correct? I mean, as far as interfacing and working with Jacobs, we're not, I mean, I mean or do I have that wrong? We're just completely walking away and sort of signing the contract and saying, Jacobs, we'll see you later, you know, let us know if you need anything. Or who is going to be in charge of working with Jacobs and sort of making sure that it's the city's best interest that are always, uh, uh, you know, kept at the top of our mind? You know? I think it'll be a collaborative effort. I think the fact of the matter is, you know, there is a, a tremendous amount of, of management and oversight responsibility that would be transitioned, but that's as it relates to the operations of the plant, uh, the collection system, the capital planning, uh, the compliance requirements with, with DEEP and EPA. Um, but at the end of the day, there's still going to be a component of, of ongoing day-to-day -day interaction with the city. Um, and it'll be a collaborative effort, I'm sure, with the mayor's office, a, a designee from that side. Uh, certainly with the finance department, there's still going to be components, particularly on the capital side, um, that will require uh, 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 compliance with our own local requirements, particularly as it relates to purchasing. Um, you know, we will be in... Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say day-to-day -day interaction, but uh, I can't uh, envision a scenario where, at least on a weekly basis, uh, there is not uh, a, uh, collaboration with Jacobs. Uh, on their end, there are obligations, uh, monthly obligations for reporting, uh, reporting <coughs> to the city, to the mayor's office, as far as um, uh, essentially a, an operational assessment on what transpired over the past month, what is happening over at the plant, uh, what any uh, what issues may come about or something that we need to be aware of as a go-forward basis. So, um, you know, but just so it's clear, we will be vesting a lot of management and oversight responsibility uh, with the Jacobs team uh, once they're on site uh, and take over from uh, the management, maintenance, and operations standpoint. Okay. All right. And I think, you know, again, you sort of answered my question, and, and I maybe have asked it, you know, not in the best way, but... I was wondering if we are maintaining the city either through the mayor's office, if we're going to hire somebody in the mayor's office, or if there's somebody already in the mayor's office or in your department or somewhere that has some level of expertise that we're going to keep in-house to properly look at a report or something like that, that when Jacobs gives us a required report about one of the provisions in this contract, I mean, it could come to the Board of Aldermen and you could say, you know, you 15 aldermen and all their women are pretty intelligent people, here's the report. And the 15 of us, I'm guessing, would look at it and go, I don't know anything about this sort of thing. This isn't my background. So I'm wondering if there's any thought for that. And I'd be remiss without saying this, and I apologize for not bringing it up in my first set of comments. Uh, we have Lynn McHale, uh, who was the former general manager over at, at WPC. Uh, she is an attorney working in our corporation counsel's office with Linda. And uh, she's got a, a tremendous amount of expertise, historical knowledge, as it relates to all of these areas from the, the plant side. Um, she was uh, a, a major uh, a piece of the process, the RFP development process, the RFP evaluation process, the interviews. Uh, she came out with us to Woonsocket to uh, tour the facility uh, and spend some time with uh, one of the key engineers. Um, so at the end of the day, um, you know, again, it will be a combination of, of the mayor's office, finance department, other departments within the city. 
uh, a collaborative approach, but certainly uh, we will continue to be tapping into uh, uh, Lynn McHale as we go forward. Okay. And the Board of Public Works as well. Um, as, uh, you, as I'm sure some of you over, are aware, they are designated with the oversight uh, responsibility for the water pollution control plan. Okay. So not, you know, knowing Attorney McHale's background, I guess maybe that's more along the lines of what I was thinking, somebody with a background in this industry and in this area who can understand some of the terminology and other things that will have to be dealt with as these reports come in and the oversight and different things like that. So um, it's at least good to know that uh, th there is somebody with that. So uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, gentlemen. I think that's all I have. Further questions? Alderman Sherman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming down. Uh, I also want to express my concern with the hiring of employees currently at the plant, and I'm pleased that that's mentioned in the contract. Um, the city has implemented reporting of spills both to residents of the city and to towns downstream. Will we continue with that reporting? Yes, we'll do okay. all the required reporting, yes. All right. Uh, concerning the monthly reports on all maintenance and maintenance work actually performed, who at the city will be receiving those reports on a monthly basis? And will we ever see a report concerning the city actually receiving those reports so we don't end up in a scenario like we did with the Palace Theater, not getting financial statements from them? Um, um, I imagine it's probably not specifically spelled out who would receive the reports, but if it's a, a desire of the Board of Aldermen to receive the reports that are produced on a monthly basis, it absolutely can be provided as part of the normal distribution. Uh, that would include, you know, certainly the Mayor's Office, uh, the Board of Public Works, uh, the Finance Office, uh, as well as legal. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Further questions? Alderman D. Giovanni Carlo. Uh, I just have two more questions. Um, I guess for the city. Are we offering any of the workers to be moved, other departments, uh, Mayor to Mayor, thank you, before the uh, transition? So I'll make sure that uh, Scott Morgan is here for you uh, Monday night before the vote. Uh, I'll answer the question the best I can, and you can drill down with him further if you need to. So there are uh, some positions in the city of Waterbury that we've held vacant um, in anticipation of trying to absorb some of the employees from the water pollution control. Um, there are some, they're not all. Um, so there, there are rules, of course, with civil service and, and uh, different requirements, but it's our feeling that there are some employees uh, that could transition into uh, some of the positions that, are, uh, that have been kept open here in the city. But as I, I, I don't want to give anyone any false hope, I know that anxiety level is high, uh, but I think that there will be some opportunities, but we'll let, uh, I think Scott Morgan is more equipped and better versed to answer that question for you on Monday night, or any of you can reach out to him uh, before Monday night if you'd like. Thank you, Mayor. And the other questions for the Jacobs gentleman in, in the contract or for anybody in the city. Who, who, section 6.3, hiring and re retention of employees. Contractor shall offer full-time employment to all qualified current city Water Pollution Control Department employees. What does qualified mean, gentlemen? Are we talking about a drug test and then they're in, or what is qualified? Because that's a, that's a big word in, in that process. So the way I'll answer that is a drug screen and a background check. And then we have, uh, depends on what jobs they apply for. So there is an application process. But in the example I'll give you, if an electrician wants to be an electrician, they have to have the proper license to be an electrician. That makes them qualified. Right. You, would you say spent like 2,000 hours? Yes. Overseeing the plant. Do you feel all our employees are qualified? I did not interview any of the staff. We only looked at the facility. Excuse me? We did not look at, we didn't talk to any of the staff members. We only looked at the facility and the assets. So, so I, can, can we answer that question? Can I, can we get the wording to say the contractor shall offer full time employment to all current city employees pending a drug test? I'm, I'm couldn't. I'm confused on the, the qualifying scares me. I, I can't answer the question of changing the contract language, but we, we have flexibility in our org chart. That was a proposed org chart, and based on the, the hiring process and the people we bring on, we'll be flexible with that org chart to bring everybody on. I understand that, but I, 
Is, is, is Mrs. Uh, Wibby, are you able to? I, I agree with the mayor. I'll defer to Scott Morgan. Essentially, is um, to not use a negative. If they're disqualified, they won't be hired. As you're saying, if they don't pass a drug test, or hypothetically, if somebody was in a licensure position and they really didn't hold their license, that would be a disqualifying event. Right. By Monday, can we have that knowledge if they're all licensed? I mean, we we don't have that. We don't necessarily check every employee's licensure certification for the position. I don't I don't know that we have that. We are undergoing and making sure, and we are also going undergoing a, a whole host of reviews from the HR perspective. So it's a really a disqualifying event. I just, you know, it, I guess I'm so looking for some I, assurance I, that they're all going to be hired is basically what I'm looking for. And yeah. I wouldn't stand here and tell you otherwise if it wasn't true. Every employee in the water pollution control facility that seeks to have a position at Jacobs, as long as they're not disqualified for a drug-related issue, will be offered a position of the same wage or higher within the Jacobs organization. Any problem with that statement? That's what's been relayed to me. There are a few employees we're hoping that may have some interest in, in some of the positions that we have within the city uh, that we've kept vacant and, and not tested for in anticipation of this. You know, I think the word qualification scares everyone, right? So I would disagree politely with the Corporation Council if, if someone represents that they hold a certification in, a, in, a, in an area of expertise, they better have the certification. Uh, and we do check those. Our civil service staff and our HR people are expected to check that, and they have to produce the certification that they're claiming to have at the time of hire. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think I understand completely what you're saying, Alderman. And you know, and I, it's a great question. It's a great question. So, you know, is this going to be a case of where there are promises made and will not be delivered? I will tell you that any employee and down at the water pollution control plant who applies for a position at Jacobs, assuming they want to work for Jacobs, and do not meet any of the disqualifiers, which clearly is drug screening, is the number one dis disqualifier across the country in any <laughs> field, whether it's water pollution control or fire police or whatever, uh, they will be offered an opportunity. If there is a a problem, then it shall be brought to our attention immediately. We will work very closely with Jacobs to identify what the problem is and find a solution to the problem. Jacobs clearly wants our employees. They need the and want the and desire the institutional knowledge that these employees have. Um, so, you know, good questions, trying to answer the best I can. There's always some unforeseen something that no one ever anticipates. But be offered the position, the wages will be comparable or higher, and they'll be allowed to organize labor uh, if, they ch if they so choose. All right, so on your word, Mayor, I, if they're all getting hired on your word, I have no other questions. Thank you. Any further questions? Alderman? Alderman Lopez? Thank you, Mr. President. I just, um, I have several questions, but to be fair, I have not finished reading the contract, so that may or may not lead uh, to an answer. Um, so I'm wondering if, uh, if it's possible to get someone who from uh, Jacobs, could we email or contact if we have any, uh, any further questions, considering the fact that we just got this today and um, we are obviously uh, meeting again on, on Monday, so there might be some, some contact back and forth. You can contact me. I can distribute my my email address, and uh, I'll also be in attendance on Monday. You have distributed your, your email address? No, I will distribute it. Does the, the city staff have my email address? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Can, can I suggest that rather than doing emails individually back and forth, that we have a contact person that the alderman can send them to, and then the answers can be distributed to the back to the board? I'm just concerned that we have too much of an offline discussion that we're going to run into FOI problems and that the full story is not going to get out there. So. 
rather than individuals there, if it's Mike, if that's, if you want to do it, if you can just send your questions to Mike, he can then get them to Jacobs. Jacobs can get the response to Mike and get him back. I know it's a little bit burdensome, but I think that covers us, that everybody will be on the same page come Monday. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, did you have something yeah. to, just to wrap up? I don't know why you just got those today, Alderman Lopez. They were filed in the city clerk's office Thursday at 4 p.m. Just saying. Um, this is a very different approach to how we do business in the city, as uh, Alderman Jacomi pointed out. This has not been an easy process for any of us. This has been 11 months of due diligence and very, very hard work of thousands of hours of research, reference checks. It's a very difficult decision, but I, I will politely and very respectfully remind all of us that this is a facility that is very complicated. This is a facility that has uh, heavy regulations through EPA and DEEP. This is a facility that is about to undergo about a $30 million phosphorus upgrade. This is a facility that has been undermanaged for many years. This is a facility that has gone through uh, issues and problems that have been well documented and brought significant embarrassment to the city. This is a facility that, by the grace of God, no one was killed down there on October 9th. These are not easy decisions. Obviously, we do care deeply for the employees and their families that are being impacted here, and that's why we've negotiated the contract in the way that we have. But, you know, there does come a time when you realize in these positions, these elected positions, that we have to make really difficult and hard decisions. Now, I feel much better about the fact that our employees will be offered positions within Jacobs, there will be some opportunity in the city, and that the compensation will be the same or better. Don't misunderstand me. I've been working here in the city for 38 years. And this is a very different approach. But this is an approach that makes sense for this department because of the issues and the technology surrounding the entire operation of this very, very important facility. And we have an obligation to the taxpayers and the residents of the city of Waterbury to make sure that we are operating a plant that is safe, that recognizes the environment, that recognizes the dangers um, of, that are involved with running a water sewer uh, filtration plant. And we have to make sure that we are willing to make the decisions oh, that is right for the city of Waterbury as a whole, obviously keeping in mind always that our employees need to be looked after and watched out for. But at the end of the day, this company is a by far at the forefront in this industry and will offer this water pollution control facility and the employees opportunities that they would never have to move up the ladder, to stay regionally, to travel around the country, in some cases the world, if they so desire to um, improve their own certifications and their own opportunities. But it's not an easy decision. I am not here standing here saying that it is. I'm very proud of the fact that our employees at the water pollution control facilities have, have understood the dilemmas that we're going through. I understand the anxieties and we're, we're doing the best we can. But at the end of the day, these are decisions that the people who put us here expect us to make. Thank you. Thank you. With that, this being a special meeting, there's no further business to come before this board, so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion having been uh, made by Alderman Rinelli, seconded by Alderman Napoli. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Thank you all for coming for the presentation, and we'll see you all again on Monday evening at 7 o'clock.